All right. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be with you here on this uh, afternoon where we really had no idea what the weather was going to be. I'll, I'll talk later about uh, plans for the congregational meeting. Um, but for now, we are ending our time in Luke's gospel. Uh, this summer, we'll be preaching through the book of Philippians. Um, that may be a surprise to some of you, as we still have a long way to go in Luke. We're in chapter 8. Uh, but it has been our practice, some of you know, along with some of our sister churches who preach uh, the same series as we do uh, simultaneously, uh, for us to preach seasonally. Uh, meaning, usually we do a gospel or acts in the winter or spring, a New Testament epistle or Old Testament wisdom literature in the summer, Old Testament narrative in the fall, an Advent series in December, sometimes a vision casting or a uh, topical series somewhere in there. Uh, longer books would be covered over several seasons and not consecutively, uh, lest they take months or even years to complete. And so what we'll do is we'll pick up here in this exact spot in Luke next January. Um, but before we move on, we have this wonderful story uh, before us. So please stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. Luke 8, 22 through 25. It's a short reading. One day he, Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a great windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And, went, and they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, we need you. Oh, how we need you. We need to hear uh, your voice uh, that can calm the winds and the waves. Your voice that can, can calm our hearts. So would you send your spirit among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, it's a short passage. It's just 120 words in English. But throughout history, many have been moved by this incredible story. The scene was depicted by the 17th century Dutch artist Rembrandt in his famous painting, uh, the original of which was actually stolen from the Isabel, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in 1990 and is still lost. Uh, if, some of you, if any of you know where it is, you should contact the authorities. But uh, I watched a good Netflix documentary on this recently that I recommend. Um, but we do have it here. You can see the, the waves uh, of Rembrandt's painting pummeling the boat. You can see the panic of the disciples. Some are reaching for Jesus. Some are frantically reaching for the mast or trying to row through the storm. One appears to be throwing up over the side of the boat. And in the midst of them, with a look of perfect calm, is Jesus. But there's one character whose expression is hard to read. He looks neither panicked nor serene as he holds a rope with one hand and his hat on his head with the other. You see who I'm talking about? What's most noticeable about this character is that he's looking straight out of the painting at the viewer. It's said that like the Mona Lisa, he appears to be looking at you wherever you go in the room. And many have observed that this character closely resembles Rembrandt's self-portraits. It seems he put himself directly into the scene as if to suggest that he identifies with the disciples going through the storm. And as he looks out at us, perhaps he's inviting us to consider how we'll respond when the storms come. Will we panic like the disciples? Or 
will we have a calm knowing that in the storm, Jesus is close by. I think we can all identify with the disciples here, going through the various storms of our lives and feeling at times forsaken, maybe feeling like God is asleep or doesn't care. And so the question that I want to ask today is this. What do we need as we face the storms of life? And as we move through this passage, we see that we need faith and we need fear. Faith in the Lord's power, fear in the Lord's power. Faith in the Lord's love and fear in the Lord's love. That's my outline. So first, we need faith in the Lord's power. Verse 22, it's Jesus who directs the disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. And as they sailed, he falls asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. Now this is accurately described. From all I've read, the Sea of Galilee is known to have violent storms. Because it's below sea level, the winds come down across it, causing sudden, severe storms, more like what you encounter on the ocean. Massive waves. A hurricane-like storm. Waves breaking into the boat so that it's filling with water. Several of Jesus' disciples were fishermen by trade, so they knew when they were in real danger and when they weren't. But they go and they wake Jesus up in a panic. Verse 24, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke, verse 25, rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Luke doesn't include what Jesus said, but from other gospel accounts, we know he basically says, like you might say to a disruptive child, shh, be quiet. I think of uh, parenting, or I think of my wife Naomi in her fourth grade classroom. Peace, be still, is really a more uh, formal translation of the words that are used. Hush, settle down. Is a, is, a, is a more accurate expression. But the crazy thing is, the storm obeys like a frightened, like a startled child. And in an instant, everything goes from chaos to calm. In an instant, not only do the winds stop, but the waves stop too. You think about it, after a storm clears, you're still going to have waves going for a while. But Jesus has power not only over the wind, but over the sea also. And that's significant because across the ancient world, the sea was viewed as the place of chaos and destruction. In the visions of Daniel, it's no coincidence that the sea was the place from where monsters came. Or that the poetry of the Psalms celebrate the Lord's power over the sea in several places. Here's just a couple, Psalm 95, which we often say as a call to worship. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And Psalm 107, in a passage that seems prophetic to this story, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. And so the disciples ask, who is this that he commands even wind and water and they obey him? Winds and water obviously don't have minds. They don't think or have ears or make decisions. And yet they obey Jesus at his word. Luke's gospel is set up in such a way that you have all these proclamations of who Jesus is at the start, from the mouths of angels and prophets, even demons. He's Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. But most of the characters of the gospel are catching up to that realization, as it were, asking, who is this that even forgives sins? Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him. And the only answer is that he is the Lord, the only one who can still the chaos and destruction with a word, is the one who created all things by the power of his word in the beginning. 
And he commands and sustains all things still. So one commentator writes, Jesus whispers to the whirlwind, and his creation obeys. This is the power of the word from the presence of the word, who is Jesus. When Jesus calms the wind and waves, he's doing what he came to do. He's transforming, transforming turmoil into tranquility and chaos into paradise. It's helpful to see that uh, in the, these three final stories in Luke 9, Jesus demonstrates first his power over the forces of nature here in this story. Second, his power over the forces of evil when he heals the demoniac. And third, his power over sickness and death in the account of him healing a woman and raising Jairus' daughter. These stories together show us that not only does Jesus have power, but that Jesus is power. That he is the one who, in one sense, all power in the universe is derived from. For all things were created by him and through him and for him, according to Colossians 1.16. In the storms of life, we need faith in the Lord's power. Second, we need fear in his power. What's the disciples' response here? Verse 25, they were afraid and they marveled and said to each other, Who is this that he commands the winds and water and they obey him? In the storm, you see, they were afraid. But once they've seen Jesus do this, they're terrified. It's like uh, in the first Lord of the Rings, the, the Fellowship of the Ring, and, and it's been a very long time since I've used an a, a example from Lord of the Rings, okay? There's a scene in which the good guys, the Fellowship, are being chased by this army of orcs, bad guys. When they suddenly, the, the army of orcs suddenly gives way and retreats. But they do so because there's a greater power, a Balrog, this ancient demon thing, coming. Now, not to compare Jesus to that, but... Here, it's like the storm gives way and the disciples turn and they see a much more powerful and ancient force. And they're afraid and awestruck in his presence. They've seen a lot of impressive things from Jesus, but in this moment, they see that their traveling teacher is a storm even wilder and more powerful than the windstorm. And in the face of a power much greater than yourself, there are a couple potential responses. One is uh, what we see whenever God is going to use someone for his purposes, that they first need to be awed and humbled in his presence. But the other response to such overwhelming power is to feel threatened, to close your eyes to it, to block it out. There are a lot of parallels between this story and the next in which Jesus drives out a demon in both stories, there's a, a powerful destructive force that no one has the power to deal with. In both, Jesus demonstrates his absolute power over these forces. And in both, the result is a deeper fear. Here, the disciples are terrified by what they've seen. And in the next story, the townspeople who see that this demoniac has been subdued by Jesus are so afraid of Jesus that they beg him to leave. They experience a terrifying power so much greater than themselves, and they want nothing to do with it. Why? Because they, because we, often prefer the illusion that we're in control. God's gracious to us when he shatters that illusion, though we sometimes cling to it so tightly. We often prefer the illusion that we're in control to the reality of a God that we can't control. The author and activist Barbara Ehrenreich describes uh, being brought up as a fourth generation atheist, but has pep uh, published a memoir, a sort of spiritual biography called Living with a Wild God. And in it, she tells the story uh, that at some point, she says, at some point in my pre-dawn walk, the world flamed into life. How else to describe it? 
Something poured into me and I poured it out into it. This was not the passive, blissful merger with the all as promised by the Eastern mystics. It was a furious encounter with a living substance that was coming at me through all things at once. And one reason for the terrible wordlessness of the experience is that you cannot observe fire with really closely without becoming part of it. She writes that this was not a gentle experience. Now, Ehrenreich is adamant that her experience is not compatible with the God of any world religion. Because she, but many Christian thinkers have questioned this assumption because she actually uses many of the same metaphors for God that are used in the Bible. She's describing in what I just read a consuming fire. Frances Spufford, a Christian author, writing a review of her book, writes that reading her memoir as a Christian, there were several times when she descri- what she described lined up so perfectly with the biblical description of God that he would stop and say audibly, Oh, come on. For example, she writes, Whatever I had seen, it was what it was, with no reference to human concerns. And this, of course, fits perfectly with the God who describes himself as, I am that I am. But Aaron Reich explains, the impasse was this. If I let myself speculate, even tentatively, about that something, if I acknowledge the possibility of a non-human agent or agents, some mysterious other intervening in my life, could I still call myself an atheist? You see what she's saying? When we've built our life and identity around something, a belief, our narrative of ourselves being at the center, and then we're confronted with a power much greater than ourselves, it's more comfortable and convenient to cling to our illusion of safety and control than be forced to change who we are, who we think we are, what we've built our identity around. And so the challenge here is twofold. First, to the skeptical, to the non-believer. Are you being honest in your skepticism? Or is there a deeper reason why you don't want to believe? And to the Christian, we should not let ourselves off the hook so easily. Because the reason that the world sometimes does not recognize God when he reveals himself to them is that we Christians have falsely portrayed God. Rather than the consuming fire, we've domesticated him to use for our purposes. Rather than an untamable God of hurricane power, we've offered a vision of God that is, in Francis Spufford's words, dull and unsurprising. Well, our God is anything but. Anyone who met God face to face in Scripture did not find him dull. And that's certainly true of the disciples here. So what do we need as we face the storms of life? Third, we need faith in his love. We may be surprised by the seeming abruptness of Jesus' question to the disciples in verse 25. Where is your faith? At first glance, it may seem like Jesus is a little grumpy after being woken up. But that's inconsistent with the patience that we see Jesus demonstrate throughout the Gospels, especially toward the disciples. So what would cause the apparent rebuke from Jesus here? Well, there's an implication that they know of his power. They obviously woke him up because they thought he could do something about the windstorm. But there's an implication that in the moment of chaos, they don't trust that he will. Mark's gospel is more clear here. It records the disciples as saying, Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? After all they've seen and gone through with Jesus, they still lack faith in his care for them. Jesus, knowing their hearts, perhaps finds there a receptiveness to the terrible lie. The biblical story begins with God enjoying perfect relationship with all of his creation, but especially with woman and man made in his image until the evil one cunningly implanted this accusation to Adam and Eve, that God is holding out on you, that he doesn't care about you, that he's not for you. 
that he can't be trusted, that he doesn't love you. Sally Lloyd-Jones depicts this so well in uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible, but, which was written for kids, but not really. She writes, as soon as the snake saw his chance, he slithered up silently to Eve. Does God really love you? The serpent whispered. If he does, why won't he let you eat the nice, juicy, delicious fruit? Poor you. Perhaps God doesn't want you to be happy. The snake's words hissed into her ears and sunk down into her heart like poison. Does God love me? Eve wondered. Suddenly she didn't know anymore. Eve picked the fruit and ate some, and Adam ate some too, and a terrible lie came into the world. It would never leave. It would live on in every human heart, whispering to every one of God's children, God doesn't love me. This is the lie that plagues all people who endeavor to live a life of faith in God, especially in the moments when God seems asleep, absent, or apathetic. We pray silently like the disciples, Lord, don't you care that I'm dying here? Why would you let me go through this? Why did you take away this, this thing or this person that I love? Why won't you give me what I long for? Why did my life take this turn? From our perception, God's power and love seem incompatible with the difficult trials of our lives, and it's so easy and natural to believe this poisonous whisper that God doesn't care. When Naomi and I were in Ireland several years ago now, we visited a uh, sheep farm uh, for a sheepdog demonstration. It turned out to be one of our, our favorite experiences we had there. And it gave me this new appreciation for biblical metaphors involving sheep, in that sheep have to be the most fretful, anxious, pliable creatures. We got a chance to talk with this uh, Irish shepherd. He was telling me that once a year, he has to gather all the sheep from this vast area of land where they roam. And because of lice and other parasites, uh, will, because they will work their way into the sheep's wool and cause disease, even kill the sheep if left unchecked, he has to force and prod every one of his sheep into this trough full of insecticide. Now, this is not a comfortable process for the sheep. They're, they're bleating. They're crying out against it. They're doing all that they can to resist. But the shepherd knows that it's only by this process that they're being saved from something much worse. How can the shepherd explain to the sheep that what he's doing He's doing for its own good. Just because we don't see a good reason for God to allow something in our lives, it does not mean that there's not one. Isn't it possible that when we face hard times in our lives, a God infinitely above us in power, knowledge, wisdom, and love is doing what's best for us? He's taking us into the storm so that he can reveal that he's the one who stills it. Robbing us of our illusion of control. It's been pointed out several times that because American culture is one of the worst in world history at dealing with suffering because we don't see any value in it. And therefore we lack the resources to deal with suffering when it comes. David Brooks, who writes for the New York Times, uh, writes in his book, The Road to Character, of the values of suffering. He, he lists them out. Suffering gives people a more accurate sense of their limitations, of what they can and cannot control. Suffering teaches dependence, teaches that life is unpredictable, and our efforts at total control are an illusion. And suffering, oddly, teaches gratitude. Brooks writes, in normal times, we treat the love we receive as a reason for self-satisfaction. I deserve to be loved, we say. But in seasons of suffering, we realize how undeserved this love is and how it should be, in fact, a cause for thanks. In other words, it's facing the storms of life 
that cause us to recognize undeserved love, a.k.a. grace. So when suffering comes and we whisper, Lord, don't you care that I'm dying? It opens us up to that still small voice reminding us, don't you care that I died for you? The Lord says to us, it's because I care for you that I lead you into the storm, reveal myself in its midst, and bring you safely through. Jesus would go on to dramatically prove to his disciples not only his power, but the power of his care, the power of his love for them. What do we need as we face the storms of life? Lastly, we need fear in his love. There's one feature of Rembrandt's painting that I left out earlier, and that is, as others have pointed out, that the mast of the ship is pronounced in the form of a cross. You look up there and you see the cross. None of the disciples are looking at the cross or even facing it. But Jesus is. It's as if the cross is looming over this entire scene, threatening to come down and crush Jesus. Whether Rembrandt intended that, I have no idea. But it's clear in Luke's gospel that at this point, Jesus' face is turned towards the cross, that he knew exactly where he was headed. He was headed into a storm. There are echoes of the Old Testament story of Jonah here. Jonah was called out by God to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, people that he despised. And so he got on a boat going as far as possible in the opposite direction. Then the storms came while Jonah was sleeping. And when Jonah was awoken, he knew that the only way to quell the raging storm brought about by his disobedience and save the people on board that ship was to throw himself into the sea, into the dark abyss. Well, here, neither Jesus nor his disciples throw themselves into the sea, but Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that the only way to quell the storm of judgment brought about not by his disobedience, but by ours. He knows that the only way to save his people is to throw himself into the dark abyss of suffering and death, the dark abyss of the cross. When Jesus responds to the disciples' panic with, where is your faith? What he's asking is, why are you so afraid? Do you still not trust me? Do you not know that I will do anything and everything to rescue you? Do you not know that I am both powerful and loving enough to save you. It's not enough to fear God's power. We also need to know that he is for us. A few years ago in my wife's uh, Naomi's school, there was a, a mom of one of Naomi's students that was uh, kind of an intense personality, a force to be reckoned with, you might say. Uh, we'll call her Frida. That's not her real name. just seems like a good name. Some of the teachers had real problems with her, but fortunately, Frida loved Naomi. Mrs. Owens could do no wrong in her eyes. And so we would joke and say, if Frida is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaims that all of God's power is for us. That immeasurable hurricane power manifested in love towards us. All that fearful power and glory and holiness and love that you read about in the Old Testament and the New is ours in Christ. And if God is for us, who can be against us? The gospel answers the poisonous accusation of the evil one that still lingers in our hearts. Because at the cross, we see his deep love and care for us. And at the resurrection, we see his power toward us, that even the forces of death could not hold him down, 
because he himself is life. If Jesus did not abandon us in the ultimate storm of the cross, we can have confidence that he will not abandon us now in the smaller storms of life. When we are awed by the Lord, that the Lord of the storm has sacrificially loved us, those who distrusted, those who rebelled from him, then his perfect love casts out fear because we are more in awe of him than the things of this world. When we're awed by his perfect love, we stop telling God what to do and start listening. We worship and submit to him as he is instead of domesticating him into whatever we want him to be. Well, Christ the Redeemer, the Lord has led us into a storm. And I don't mean today. I'm not talking about the weather. When we launched in March of 2020, we didn't know what the next season would bring. Like the disciples, we didn't know that a storm would suddenly rise up, not only from the pandemic, but a difficult season of ministry all around. We didn't know. But God knew. And he planted this new church in Quincy for such a time as this. He led us into the storm to reveal that he is the Lord of the storm. To reveal himself, not only his power, but his heart. That we may discover that he is faithful. That his grace is sufficient. That he is powerful and loving enough to rescue. Because he has gone through the storm of death and hell and come out victorious. Will we trust him? Will we follow him into the unknown? It may be scary, but I can promise you this. It will be worth it. It's in the storms that we experience his power, his love for us. It's in the storms of life that we taste and see that he is good, that he is faithful, that he is worthy, and that we know that he will lead us safely home. Let's pray. Lord, may we know, would you give us the grace to believe, as Paul prays in Ephesians, what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards us who believe. And also that we may know the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of your love for us, which surpasses knowledge. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts as we come to your table, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.